What's going on? I'm making sure we are live here with Drangler's Fly Fishing Festival of 2022. Can you see? Yep, looks like we're good. And this is our 2022 Fly Fishing Festival. Um, this is going to be a hybrid because last year, if you remember, we did a lot of um, virtual stuff like we're doing tonight, but we got something going on tonight, tomorrow night, and then Saturday we're in person, thankfully, uh, again after two years. So um, if you've remembered uh, our event for the last handful of years, you'll remember that we always do a big event in Santa Rita Park, and that's what we're going to be doing. So, and we got lots of good stuff tonight. We got Dave McCoy, who's going to be talking uh, Seattle and Puget Sound. Uh, tomorrow night at 5.30 on our YouTube channel, Britta Fordyce is going to be tying lots of flies and talking fly tying. And then Saturday, 10 a.m., Santa Rita Park, we have rods to cast from Sage, Reddington, Scott, G. Loomis, Orvis, um, Sims, and Patagonia waiters are going to be there. And tonight, Dave McCoy uh, is a Patagonia ambassador, and for the first time in uh, ever, we've had a full lineup of Patagonia waiters at the shop. So you'll be able to check those out uh, when you come on Saturday. Um, we got some videos on our YouTube channel, I think. I'll have to make sure of that now that I'm saying that. Anyway, we got lots of gear uh, giveaways uh, that will be given away on Saturday. You don't have to be present to win. So if you signed up tonight, which you can sign up in the link below on our YouTube channel or our YouTube description in this video, you can sign up and we will enter your name uh, one entry per night, meaning tonight and tomorrow night. And then if you come Saturday, you'll get more entries to win some stuff. Uh, big one being a fly fishing, I can't, I can't talk right now, fly uh, guided trip with Tom Knopic. <laughs> so uh, stick around, do that. And then I'm going to turn Oh, one other thing. Yeah, so if you come on Saturday as well, we're going to have a lot of rods to cast, and you're going to get more entries to cast to win those tricks. I can't talk. Anyway, giveaway stuff. We'll talk more about that when we're done. And I'm going to pull up Dave McCoy, and feel free. We got a chat, uh, chat service here on YouTube, so ask questions. And here we go. Dave, you are live. Right now? Right now. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, Andy, thank you for, uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for the intro. Thanks. And uh, thank you to everyone. Uh, hopefully there's more than two or three of you that are tuning in for this. Um, boy, where to start? What was that, Andy? Oh, we got about 10, 12 people showing up right now. Yeah. So, yeah. We got awesome. Well, I'll take I'll do the slow the slow intro on on this before I get to the pictures. Let a few late arrivers get in here. Um, this is this is kind of a homecoming for me, which is pretty exciting. Uh, I'm I used to live in Telluride. Really, sort of cut my teeth guiding um, on the San Miguel and the Dolores and the Gunnison, and so I was influenced fairly heavily from both John and Tom with during my time down there, mostly in the Black Canyon. Uh, so being asked to come back but back here and do this is, is kind of an honor for me. I'm, I'm super appreciative for the opportunity. But moving away from the uh, Southwest, I'm going to bring you up to the Seattle area. I moved up to Seattle from directly from Telluride about 23 years ago. And when I moved up here, I uh, I just, you know, I'd been kind of trained on what guiding in Colorado was like, and it was, you know, guide service and destination rivers and all that stuff. And so I just, you know, I had my guide resume and I was ready to hand it off to all the shops up here. And when I, when I got here, to my astonishment, nobody really had a guide service in Western Washington. There were individual guides, you know, Deck Hogan was here at that time and and uh, John Farrar and Mike Kinney, some fairly notable names in the steelhead world. But by and large, there was really only one guide service in all of Washington and they were over on the Yakima. So that kind of bewildered me at first. It just didn't make sense because when you fly into Seattle on a clear blue day, 
uh, you just see water everywhere. And anybody that fly fishes just kind of gets, I'll keep it G rated, gets kind of excited. And, um, and then you get on the ground and you realize, oh my God, that much water from the air is just that much more water that you have to know up here. And it's not all created equal. Uh, uh, living in the Southwest or in the Rockies in general, pretty lucky because everything has fish in it. And most everything that has fish in it has pretty nice fish in it. And, you know, that's because that's kind of resident trout world. And up here, we're kind of a migratory or anadromous uh, fish country, at least on the west side of the mountains. And so we don't grow big resident trout here. We get small and you get some trout that stay residential with some of the rivers and stuff like that. But by and large, it's just it's just not the same. It's apples and oranges, to be totally honest with you. Um, so uh, I decided to start my own guide service because I just couldn't imagine there not being enough opportunity for people in the Seattle or Western Washington area to uh, want to be guided and to learn some of the water better that was up here. And so I started it and this was I'm not knowing the age of everybody that's on here kind of almost at the inception of the internet. Um, I had one of the first websites for fly fishing in the Seattle area, <laughs> which <laughs> that dates me a little bit, unfortunately. And so um, I, yeah, I just kind of, I, I started this and just kind of from the seat of my pants, just started figuring out how to how to guide the water around here. Steelheading, I grew up in Oregon, so I kind of had that under my belt. That wasn't a problem. Trout, I kind of had under my belt from being in Colorado for the years that I was down there. But there was one fishery in particular up here that really uh, is prominent, stood out, does stand out, um, and that was Puget Sound. And as I started to be introduced to it through people that I became involved with in the Seattle area, I became more intrigued by it. And it was, it was a pretty, pretty short romantic uh, interlude before I was all in um, because I was, I, I just knew I wanted to do this. Um, Puget Sound has upwards of 3000 miles of shoreline within it. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that if you were to measure it out, Puget Sound itself has more sh linear shoreline with the islands and so on than the west coast of the United States does. So there's no lack of, of water to access here. The big problem is that much like everybody in the southwest, you're introduced to fly fishing in a river. Water flows this way or it flows this way and uh, there's confines to it. There's a bank on the left and a bank on the right and you kind of read water in accordance with that. And here, you know, you, you step out and you make your best, you know, I'm sure we're all cast in hundred feet, draining the fly line off the, off the reel. You make your best hundred foot cast out there and you look and it's seven miles across to the next piece of shoreline and it feels a little intimidating. It's a little daunting. Uh, add to that wind and, and a bunch of other things. And so Puget Sound, just because it was so different than what I was used to, I just, I, I just, I was, like I said, I was all in. I was totally intrigued and I wanted to know more and, and I could tell immediately it was gonna make me a better angler. So um, I'm gonna share screen and go through some photos to try to bring some life to what I just said. I think Andy's gonna try to feed me questions and I'm, I don't read off, off of a script. I do this kind of from the, from the hip. So if somebody has questions, I, it helps me know what's going through your mind and it keeps us engaged as a, as a dialogue, as opposed to me just splurting stuff at you. So um, feel free, Let's see if this will work. Share and there Perfect. and there there we go so uh this is my company emerald water anglers in seattle uh fly shop guide service travel service yada yada same same as Duranglers, just in a different state um this is uh on the the yellowish fish on there is the sea run cutthroat which for this fishery here that's really our target 
Um, we obviously have five species of salmon that come, come back to Puget Sound and we've got, you know, rivers from clear up by Be Bellingham, the Nooksack, going clear down south past uh, Olympia to the, um, to the Skokomish and all the way out North Hood Canal. I mean, there's so much water here, it's ridiculous. And so the salmon, is, the salmon are one thing, they're seasonal. The one thing that's cool about the sea run cutthroat, one, it's, it's a native cutthroat, otherwise known as uh, Clarky Clarky or the coastal cutthroat trout you know, cousin to your greenbacks and um, the uh, other versions of the cutthroat you have down there. And they're, they're just, they're just another cutthroat. They are curious. Um, they're unique in the anadromous world because as biologists around here, have, you know, study them more, they have realized that they are capable of metabolizing themselves between fresh and salt water almost at will. Uh, so it's not a seasonal thing where they have to sort of gear up to metabolize and then stay in the rivers for three months or whatever, to only to return to the salt. Uh, as of late, the Coastal Cutthroat Coalition, uh, if you're interested, you can go to their website and look at it, uh, was started by WDFW biologists so that they could better understand these fish because they're passionate about them themselves. Uh, but as of late, they've been realizing these fish can come and go from salt into fresh back into salt on, in the same day if they really wanted to, which in the world of anadromy and fish is pretty remarkable. So uh, aerial view of Puget Sound, I really dig this because it does give you this tropical sense. And the, while that does exist, this place is so dynamic. The next shot, you know, I could also show you a shot where it looked like it would look like you were in the Aleutians and just had a vertical drop from the shore. So there's, there's a lot to understand about this fishery. There's kind of our stereotypical um, coastal cutthroat, super golden spotted from back to belly and from head to tail uh slashes so when you see them in the salt one of the cool things about these fish in the salt is because of how the predators on them are like most fish in salt water or even pelagic species um they turn white in the belly to create a surface disguise when being fed on from above so their slashes will almost all but disappear when they've been in the salt water for a long time Gold usually means that they are a little bit fresher coming back out of the fresh water back into the salt. Once they've been in the salt for a long time, uh, you'll see them have a more silvery or almost even a rainbowy look, but their belly and stuff will definitely be wider. But the one thing they never lose is right at that little joint on that pectoral fin, the, there's always this tinge of, of gold that, that, it helps identify them. And that's what I always try to help people, you know, when they start catching salmon of similar size, that's, that's the way to really kind of know that that's what they are spotting too, but that sometimes is hard to tell as well. Um, as far as size goes up here in the, in the sound, the, the trout really, like, I know everybody hears salt water and they're like, oh my God, so do you use like eight and 10 weights for these things? Like, do they get as long as your leg? No, <laughs> no, not even close. Uh, I would say that, you know, our average fish, when I'm talking to people about them, they're 14 to 16 inches. So really by Colorado standards, not even that great of a fish. So, you know, what I would, what I would want to tell people to help this be intriguing is that you are catching a cutthroat in salt water. There's just not a lot of places that you're ever going to be able to do that. And for that reason, they're super unique. This photo in, in my mind gives you the vastness of the watershed and helps you kind of wrap your mind around how daunting it can be when you step into it for the first time from a river. Um, we field the question every day, like, holy crap, where in the hell do you start? Um, and it's, it's a valid question, uh, for me personally, um, and I should have prefaced this whole thing with this. I'm very verbose. Like I'll talk until tomorrow morning 
if given the opportunity. I'm going to try not to do that. So um, the uh, I've over the last 20 years, I, like many people in the sport, you sort of fish away, you fish to catch fish. And then as you figure out how to catch them, you start sort of dwindling yourself down to how you want to catch them, not just catching them. And so for me, uh, I fish hundred percent surface flies for these, for these fish. They're a cutthroat uh, through and through. They're super curious. And at night in particular, fishing that surface fly, like if you ever just want to understand why they do this and why I fish the surface, even where you are right now, if you were to hold your hand over your head and look up at it, you'll you see how much of a prominent silhouette that creates and from how far away you're able to detect that. Well, it's the same for the fish. If you're fishing subsurface with bait fish patterns and stuff like that, you, you know, you do have to be a little bit closer to them. They are adept, obviously, and this water typically is gin clear. But when you broadcast something on the surface, and the fly that I use, which I'm sure there'll be a photo of in here, is called a sound searcher. It's intended to be an injured bait fish rolled over on its side, so the eyes on the bottom, and all you're doing is just kind of giving it this little creasy wake across the surface. When you see that coming across over your head, especially at night, these fish can detect that from so far away. And with their curiosity, they're going to come check it out. Um, you know, starting with uh, with those flies, I didn't used to fish that way, but I remember <laughs> had a guide working for me for a while who had tied this fly that Umpqua was picking up, Andrew Grillos, and he he had this hopper pattern or the stonefly pattern. He needed a photo of it for a magazine article with a, with it in a fish's mouth. And it was like January here. <laughs> and there's no way of getting a trout in Washington to hit a dry fly in January. It's just, it's just not happening. And so I was like, no, we can get it. Let's go out to the sound. So we took his, I think he called it the pool toy or something like that. And we took it out and like fifth cast in the sound stuck a you know, really nice 16, 17 inch cutthroat. And that kind of opened my eyes to the idea that I don't know why I'm fishing subsurface. I'm just going to fish surface uh, from then forward. Um, and, you know, part of the other reason for that was after guiding a lot um, and everybody comes to the table with a different skill set, casting wise, line management wise, stuff like that. And there are things that exist in the sound like uh, shellfish netting to help protect the harvestable oysters and clams and gooey duck and stuff. And in the summer, that netting grows an algae and elevates in the water column. And when you hear Britta talk about this, she's probably going to show you 100% subsurface patterns. And her husband, who's also a guide here, Justin, uh, will tell you he probably fishes 100% of the time with an intermediate line. And I would tell you that this sport and that situation 100% proves that we are almost as 100% subjective on every way that we fish as possible. Um, cause I only fish floating lines and that comes from, they're just easier to manage. And I watched it the other day with, um, some clients that were okay casters, but couldn't get a cast to lay out straight enough to where their fly and line wouldn't sink down and hang bottom before they started to strip. So we spent a lot of time unhooking flies and that, that's just kind of the nature of the beast. But out here, you don't necessarily need to do that. And if you did want to fish subsurface or on the surface, you're obviously not going to do that with the intermediate. So I'm a fan of being as versatile as possible and how I approach most fisheries until I really can gauge exactly how I want to approach it. And even then, I'm still fishing surface flies. Um, now, you saw that previous slide. Sometimes the sound looks like that, and sometimes it looks like that. And, you know, in the, in the vein of trying to help people figure this fishery out when they move here or when they come to visit and are driving through or something like that, there's a, this is where the nuance to finding success out here 
sooner rather than later comes. More than likely, you're going to do it on foot. And that's going to relegate you to certain access points throughout the sound. And knowing which access point points are accessible at what tide levels, uh, and not just what tide levels, but what tide levels during what season, and then throw wind into the into the factor. And now you've got a three-prong approach to at least a three-prong approach to every single day that you go out that you kind of have to take into consideration. Um, some beaches will be in the lee of the wind and it would look like the previous photo while across the water would look like this. So understanding which beaches to hit uh, at what time is key. Uh, some beaches at high tide, you just, you can't fish. You're up in the trees. You're literally standing with trees hanging over your shoulders. You're clearly not going to cast. Um, other beaches at low tide are complete mud flats, and there's absolutely no reason that the fish are going to sit over those mud flats on a calm day. So you kind of have to understand that as far as where you're going to fish, when, and why, and stuff like that. Um, Equipment-wise out here, five, six weights, plenty. Uh, even as you move into coho season, uh, from the beach, yes, you can get decent sized coho out here. Uh, but by and large, most of your coho or your silver salmon are going to be like three to six or eight pounds. Um, they will kick your ass on a six weight, which is a great problem to have. But a six weight still, these days, your six weight is ample rod for, for the fish of that size. Uh, and the lines that we can use. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm with scientific angler, but airflow makes a great cold saltwater line. That's not a shooting head, but it's a more aggressive, uh, weight forward line that will deliver bigger flies into wind at distance. It's very carryable line. So if you're a good caster, you'll find yourself being able to carry 50, 60 feet of line shooting to 70, 80, 90. Um, we started trying to use when the first outbounds and stuff like that came out. Uh, we were so excited. I was just pumped. I'm like, this is it. Uh, this is the tool I've been waiting for. The whole world is going to be able to throw a mile of line. And I don't know how many of you have, have uh, thrown, you know, the short single hand shooting headlines like outbounds or, uh, or, um, whatever the 40 pluses from airflow and stuff there there's a skill set required to truly take advantage of those lines and what they're intended to do and it separates casters from non-casters pretty quickly so i bought a whole bunch of those and then they just sat and i went back to way forward lines so <laughs> it, it's a good thing to try out i will tell you that when i moved from colorado up to here and started fishing the sound First guide I hired to work for me, we go up to Whidbey Island and there's salmon rolling at probably 70, 80 feet. You know, it's kind of the way of the sport. I kind of thought I was all that. I was, you know, pretty, pretty well respected guide where I worked and, you know, down there and tell your ride and stuff. And, and I'd started my own guide business, which I mean, that obviously makes you all that. So I, you know, I, I was thinking pretty highly of myself and I pulled my line off of my Scott Eclipse rod and shelled out a cast and guy that I'd hired, Dylan, looks at me and just goes, <laughs> is that it? And I looked at him like, what do you mean? And he pulled, he, he pulled all of his fly line off, cast the whole fly line into the backing and was like, I was like, oh. Wow. And he looks at me and goes, yeah, why do I work for you? <laughs> so I got put in my place a little bit, but all it did was, again, it just sort of intrigued and inspired me that I obviously had room to grow. And the thing I will tell most people that live around here and get to fish this fishery every day is it will make you one hell of an angler, period. Um, being able to read the water uh the way it moves on tides because it's not like a river that's consistent as you're standing there as a tide comes in it changes how it moves across the shoreline that you're on and if the shoreline 
has ebbs and flows to it. The water will accelerate in certain places as it comes in and stall in certain places. And so being able to really read that water for what it is and how it changes, man, you go back to a river and all of a sudden you see the matrix. Like you see seams and, and, and different nuance to the water that you had probably never seen before. Um, so there's that on top of being able to cast you know, learning how to cast good distance and in wind uh, here that will help with making you a much better angler. Um, four season a year fishery. We've got mostly up here, we've got two of them. Uh, I was telling Andy when we were talking last time, we've got one river, the Yakima, that garners a lot of attention uh, and adoration, mostly because of just that. It is our only year round trout, resident trout fishery in the entire state of Washington, really. Um, there's other rivers you can kind of go after trout in, you know, during the winter, but they're, they're just, the Yakima is the only recognized one that's really worth going to. And because of that, there's probably 500 guides over there on that river. Um, so, Outside of that, Puget Sound is our other one. And because the bulk of the population in Washington lives within probably 20, 30, 40 minutes of Puget Sound, I try to encourage people to think of this as their home water. And the more time they spend on this, the, the better they can look at it, the more they start to really resonate with where they like to fish and why. And they start being able to look at their beach like if you go to the same piece of water on the Animus or uh, on the San Juan or um, even over to the uh, lower D, stuff like that, you, the more you go to the same spot, you start to notice finer and finer detail of that place. You become more proficient at covering it. And it's, it's exactly the same here. Even though this is an expansive watershed, anything beyond whatever you can cast to, who cares? There's really no sense worrying about it. So you effectively end up covering the same amount of water. And so paying attention to everything that's from your fly to you helps kind of separate the vastness into something that's more digestible. And I start every day, even when I'm out guiding, I start every day standing on a beach and just watching water. I just look at the water and there's, there's a number of reasons for it. One, um, beaches change. <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard to imagine, but the flow and the points and the spits where creeks and stuff come in, they change in high and low water situations when we get storms, stuff like that. Um, and so I like to just see how the water's moving on the, on the beach as it is. I like to see if there's fish rolling. Uh, we're in the time of year up here where all of the fry from the salmon spawning are starting to exit the streams and make their migration up to Alaska. So you're starting to see those in the water. And when they're in the water, you see water with, you see different predators in the water interacting differently. And a lot of times for people that are new to it, I'm just trying to find one singular thing to give them a reason to start someplace versus just any place on a mile long beach. And when the seagulls fly, it spooks bait. And a lot of times you'll see bait sort of pop and sprinkle on the surface. And there you go. There's your reason. If you don't know anything else, but you see bait popping right there, go step in near the bait because bait are going to attract the fish at some point in time. Um, and that's, that's really probably one of the most frustrating parts of the sound is that these fish aren't, uh, they aren't, um, there we go. They aren't residential to a beach. We call it beach fidelity uh, as much. They migrate. And I believe they migrate within a column of water that shifts with tides. So you might go to a beach and, at, and catch 20 fish one day, go out there the next day and there's none. They're 10 miles up the beach or down the beach somewhere else. Um, and so that's, that's also why knowing more of the, more of the access points is always a good idea. Um, these guys chase, you know, chase fish around, uh, that one on the right is probably five and a half feet long, 
just to give you scale, he's probably as big as you, Andy. Yeah, massive. Um, cute and cuddly until you start walking towards them and their hackles stand up. But this also is, again, one of the reasons that, you know, having grown up fishing rivers, uh, engaging in the sound and the salt water was an entire, entirely different, you know, sort of immersion for me because all of the different things that are out here from killer whales and sharks and orca to the starfish and miles of sand dollar beds and squid and, um, and just all of it, it's unbelievable. It, it's such a diverse uh, watershed that every single day is different. It's just different. Super cool. Andy, any questions yet? Or has everybody left? Or No, everyone's still here. Uh, feel free to ask any <laughs> questions you guys have. Though. Okay, I have I've got a few myself, but... Oh, I uh, fire, fire away. Sure. I'm just trying to check all my boxes. So. Yeah, so do you, my question was, I mean, do you get a lot of sight fishing opportunities, like see a fish cruising and then cast to it? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. I think, you know, when you, when you look at that first photo that I started with, that makes it look really tropical, um, you would think that you, you would so easily just walk up and spot a fish and cast to it, like you would a bonefish or something like that. And I think if you've, trout fished ever and let a fish go from your hand and watched how quickly it just fades into the bottom of the river. You're like, what? It should be right there. Uh, these fish are so well suited to the bottom of this, of this fishery that man, you, you will see them chase bait on the surface and jump and that's your sight casting opportunity. Uh -huh. But you flat out will not even from a boat 99% of the time, spot the fish while you're fishing for them that's amazing it's un it, it's so frustrating you just the water's gin freaking clear you just so think you'd see them but um <laughs> you literally have to be vertical over the top of them like if you're standing on a ferry terminal uh or if you were to run a drone there's some drone footage where people have captured fish cruising uh -huh. if you're not straight over the top of them you're not seeing them wow even in the right light it's pretty amazing that's so amazing so i know the other question i did have was i know that the steelhead situation in the pacific northwest is sad but does anyone ever catch them in the sound like doing this kind of fishing <laughs> yeah yeah there's been there's been a few like i think 30 40 years ago up on whidbey island like if you look at where all the steelhead rivers are within uh -huh. the sound um and look at where they enter the sound from and take the path of least resistance to their spawning river. You can kind of gather a few points where they're going to touch ground on their way to that river okay. or come close to touching ground. And those are places like Bush Point up on Whidbey Island where, have, you know, when I first moved here, I was told, absolutely, you can catch steelhead in the sound. Um, I know like two or three people that have done it. Wow. Uh, it just doesn't happen that frequently, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I never bring it up. Uh, obviously they are out there, but it just is so infrequent that I don't even, I don't even talk about it. Um, so for those who've never seen them, it's, this isn't the greatest shot of them, but the crabs sitting next to these little dark specks, those are live sand dollars. So that's what a sand dollar looks like when it's still alive. It's kind of a charcoal gray brown. And when you pick them up and set them on your hand, you can feel them gently kind of moving their cilia or their legs around and they'll slowly move across your hand. It's pretty cool. And you know, the, cr the crab patterns and stuff like that. Uh, this is this again, this is one of those things like the sound has so many faces to it. So you can see this is a sandy bottom. And there's muddy bottoms and there's shrimp and all these different food forms out here that these cutthroat will feed on. And sometimes when you get the bigger ones, like the ones that have enough tail that they can really root around and dig in the rocks, you'll see their noses are just scratched up like crazy because they're turning small rocks over or chasing these crabs into crevices and stuff like that. And so a few, a few of our customers, and I've done it a couple of times, like you can see there's one buried under the 
um, under the sand a little bit right in front of that one, uh, <laughs> that one sand dollar right in the middle. Um, they will, uh, a couple of guys will go down and fish like permit crab patterns on those beaches where they know they've got that nice flat muddy bottom and they'll just throw it out, let it sink and they'll just slowly retrieve it back and they catch quite a few fish that way. <laughs> It's pretty fun, man. Yeah, so you can like strip set and everything just like that. It's it's pretty cool. Uh, and here again, you know, whales and stuff like that are, are out there. You don't see them often. In fact, like I never see them because I carry a freaking camera and never see the orcas. So if you're ever up here and want to go fish, tell me to leave my camera at home because then we'll probably see them. Um, you know, I talk a lot about how, how good an angler this, this will make you, uh, the reality is we catch most of our fish at like 30 feet, 20 to 30 feet. So you don't have to be great. There are things and there are like happenstance within, within the sound and times when you're fishing where being able to cast further is going to give your fly more presence in the water along along you know places where they're gonna they're gonna be more apt to be tide lines along structure shoreline stuff like that so what i usually do is if you, if anybody steelhead fishes i'm usually telling people this is a little bit like covering the water with a casting net if you will so if you um, i don't andy are people able to see me while i'm doing this or yeah they can see okay you. so when you're, when you go out, let's say you step in and the tidal current's moving right to left. Most of what we fish with is bait fish patterns. I mean, Britta ties some brilliant squid patterns and you fozzed and polykeet and you should absolutely tune into Britta's thing tomorrow and uh, ask her questions about how she's determining those flies that she's tying to imitate all these different food forms. Cause it's, it's exhausting. Copepods, euphosids, polychaetes, um, monopods, like all these things that are like food forms that are, you know, all the shrimp, mud shrimp and kelp shrimp. And it, it's like a diverse river, but none of it's the same. <laughs> so, so like getting, getting in and, and, and really understanding that side of this fishery is is super exciting and at the same time horribly frustrating uh, because like another, it another side to it, entomology but no it is it's relearning fly fishing from the very beginning as far as as far as that goes um and i kind of forgot where i was going with that but if you step into the water uh because what you're fishing is usually being predated upon and it has enough of an idea of that that it's trying to escape throwing up current like we're accustomed to with dry flies and nymphs and stuff like that because the current brings the food to the fish that makes sense out here everything's fleeing predation and so when you present your fly you want to present it in a way where it looks like it is trying to escape i mean imagine you uh traipsing through the woods and coming across a really aggressive bear are you going to just sort of be like, oh, please, bear, don't catch me. Oh, oh. No, you're going to run your ass off or you're going to stand there and fight, either, whichever. But you get, my, you get my point. You need to make the whatever, you're, whatever fly you're using look like it's trying to flee. And so if you throw up current, even though it's tidal and it doesn't look like it's moving that fast, it's moving faster than you think. And so as it moves really fast, what you want to be able to do is move your fly faster. And if you throw up current, a lot of times it just makes your fly kind of look like that. Oh, bear, no, please. You know, it, you don't want that. You want it boom, boom, boom. You want it scooting really fast. Uh, in fact, when we do schools this time of year, we go out and we um, try to find the bait schools and, and show people how the different uh, bait fish flee predation. Cause all of them have a slightly different nuance to how they move away from, from predation. Uh, salmon fry typically boom shotgun. It's each for their own. They all go in different directions, super fast. Uh, herring 
tend to stay more level in the water column and gently, you know, get a little bit tighter and move towards the surface a little bit. Sand lance, ball up and drop. So understanding that helps you better understand how to present your fly to them. So I always say step in, cast straight across current, then cast 70% down, 45% down, and then about 20% or parallel to the, to the beach. After you've done those four, walk half the distance of your cast and repeat and just cover the beach that way. And that way, when you've covered the beach, uh, if you know it's the only beach that you're going to fish that day and it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to relocate to a new one, mm -hmm. whether the tide's incoming or outgoing, if that took you an hour, you probably either lost a foot of water or gained a foot of water. And so if you walked back up and did it again, you're you're kind of fishing new water from where you started. Oh, totally. Uh, not like a river that stays the same, obviously. So that's that's more or less how I kind of coach people to approach it. Um, and it's it's almost all streamer fishing. We don't. There's a couple of guys that dead drift nymphs and stuff like you know the little euphosids and stuff like that out there. Um, but otherwise, not so much. That's a good thing to note for anyone who fishes streamers anywhere too what yeah is your bait fish doing is it a yeah rainbow trout fry or a sculpin <laughs> yeah i mean it's exactly that's exactly what it is and i think if anything after i moved here and i came back down to the gunnison to guide again uh -huh. my streamer game was so much better than it was when i left nice. just from having a better understanding of that mm -hmm. oh we got a question it's, for you yeah uh, will his uh mike asks will his belize crab pattern work <laughs> absolutely nice. get up here and try it uh so i don't i don't want to spend a ton of time on this but this is a chum salmon uh super toothy you do need a 10 weight for this so i think tom and john will enjoy this comment that's it's what i usually tell people up here i think in colorado you're you're pretty good shape with one rod you know you can cover most of what you do with a five weight six weight maybe a four weight these days you know um up here we've got small little creek trout you know like this we've got our regular trout you know like this so you got two three weight zero through three weight yeah five four five six weight uh we got small mouth bass large mouth bass which you know kind of six seven weight then you got coho um if you're fishing from a boat or if you wanted to chase some of the bigger warm water species you might go seven eight weight go to chum and and you're probably talking eight to ten weight go to chinook you got you're talking 10 12 weight uh steelhead all of us use spay rods so there's there's a spay rod and then you've got trout spay so if you're thinking of moving up here um i'm sure tom would appreciate it if you just came in and bolstered your quiver before you did so. So you're going to need probably eight or 10 rods to <laughs> cover Washington. We got you covered. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> so, uh, the pink salmon, you know, are an every other year thing and they're, they're on average two to four pounds. So again, your five, six weight does just fine. And I've tried for 20 years to get one of these turds with fins to, uh, eat a, eat a surface fly, even a pink one, and they will not do it. Um, so you, pink flies are what they like for whatever reason, that's just mostly what they, eat. they will eat other stuff, especially the super fresh ones. But once they've started to habitate themselves a little bit, they, uh, um, they will only eat pink. This is just as beautiful a specimen of our coastal cutthroat as you'll see. Um, and you can see how this rock bottom looks. This is why the bigger ones get pretty scratched up noses and stuff like that, because they're rooting around in there for those crabs and shrimp. So usually this is what I start with to give you an idea of uh, the breadth of the sound. So if you, this is, <laughs> this doesn't even constitute all of it. So clear at the top, you can see Anacortis up there. That's kind of the north end, just a little bit north of the top end of Whidbey Island, which is actually 
where Fidalgo Island is. There's a little bridge right there that goes on to Whidbey. Whidbey's the second longest island in the United States behind Long Island in New York. Um, and that is kind of the collision point for a bunch of our migratory fish when they come in from the ocean, uh, they come in through the Straits of Juan de Fuca there. And that's, that's where we collide with all of our salmon, typically during salmon season. Um, Mount Vernon, you've got the Skagit up above Anacortes, you've got the uh, Nooksack, you come in here on the inside of Kameno, and you've got the um, Skykomish and uh, Snoqualmie uh, rivers kind of flow in there by Marysville or just a little bit south of Marysville down by uh, Everett Snohomish, it's called the Snohomish system. And then you come down. So we've got all these rivers down through here. So what you're looking at there is with all the islands and everything, you're looking at, like I said, almost 3,000 miles of shoreline. Um, and that, that by itself is quite a thing to try to absorb. And it's not all created equal. When you look at the top part of the sound and how big the water is up there, many of the beaches are real sandy. And so when you think about what I was saying earlier about how fish migrate and why, you know, these fish are curious. They're not predetermined or predestined to be a certain way like a salmon is. Salmon knows that it's on its way to spawn. It knows what kind of bait it should be seeing along its pathway from Alaska back to its spawning habitat. And so anything that doesn't quite a fit into that instinctual mold, um, doesn't fly. That's why you'll see salmon just flat out ignore things that aren't what they're eating on their way down. Um, cutthroat, they wake up every day, so to speak. It's a new day to live. I, who knows what I can do today? And so that's why they're so curious. That's why they cover, they'll eat such a broad spectrum of different, of different flies. Um, but in that sense, knowing which beaches are going to be better than others comes down to what is the habitat surrounding where you're fishing for them look like? It, does it have the, you got to kind of think in reverse. So what they're feeding on, those euphosids, those shrimp and crabs and copepods and polychaetes and stuff like that, does the habitat you're fishing over provide sanctuary for those food forms? And if so, those fish will stay more residential to beaches like that, especially if it's near where they're spawning. If the beach you're fishing over is real sandy where those, like those crabs and sand dollars were, eh, if they're passing through and there's nothing that compels them to stay there, they're probably gonna just continue to pass on by. And I, I kind of, I hope that kind of makes sense to, to everyone. So I just, I've just kept, blowing this up. So now we're looking at the south end of the sound and this is, so Bainbridge Island where sage is made is sitting right there. And our store is just off of the point that is just to the right of that. Um, but south, towards the south end of, uh, south end of Bainbridge there, that's West Seattle where we are. And so as you come down here, the watersheds get smaller, you get these micro bays, you get these bays where you don't have this you know, trillion gallon flush of water passing by all the time, it tends to be a little bit more of a flood in and flood out type of uh, tidal movement with that substrate that I was talking about. And that's where you're gonna find fish being more residential. So when we guide cutthroat, we're typically going south. And Hood Canal down here, which is this big elbow on your left, this big dog leg is one of our favorites. Um, that Skokomish that's just in the far bottom left where you can only see the Okomish part. And then Tahuya, all these little creeks that flow in and all these different places provide the spawning uh, places for, you know, within proximity of that habitat I was talking about. So that's, that's kind of what you're looking at. Uh, any other questions? There's Hillary taking in some of the Sardinia. Um, so that's, that's actually kind of a fun point. So when, you know, we're starting the, the seasonal sort of uh, hatch, if you will, when, within the sound, it always starts with the chum fry. 
as we go through the summer, you go, you know, you go chum fry, then you go, you'll go pink, chum pink fry, then coho, then king, then uh, you'll get into your premature, your early stage uh, herring and sand lance. And then you get the sardinia. Um, you start to get all these different food forms and having flies that imitate those. It's if you're a fly tire, it's kind of fun because like on our site, we we have a page that shows you the different food forms so that if you're into tying imitative patterns, which you should be here, um, you can start like on bait fish. It's cool to pay attention to where the eye is located on the head, how big it is. What does that profile look like? Like you can see this one eye is located really close to the nose, and fairly prominent. And before it, it spawned and blew its belly out, it had a pretty deep profile to it. So having a fly that has a little bit more girth through the middle of it, but then tails back out is, is what you'd be looking for. So, uh, and Britta ties some incredible patterns in that department. So definitely tune in to see what she's tying tomorrow. And there's, and there's kind of an example for you. Profile is a big deal. <laughs> yeah, huge deal. And the coloration is a big deal too. Like this doesn't do justice to the difference between, you know, just a dark and a white. Like if you're creating that lateral line, it, there's so much more to it than just doing dark and dark and light, right? Yeah. So purples and blues and fuchsias and pinks kind of roll through the backs of these in the right sunlight, even some like magenta and green like it's it's stunning the, the coloration so you can get really creative in how those backs lay out um britta and i both were sort of conditioned on flat wing patterns that were done by kenny abrams on the east coast you know <laughs> 25 30 years ago yep. um for stripers he had a company called striper moon and he bred and dyed his own saddles for tying flat wing patterns. And I absolutely love flat wings for, for saltwater species around the planet, actually. Um, but certainly here in the sound. Our shop manager, Rob, is from upstate New York. And yeah. he is, loves striper fishing. He says the same thing, like yeah. hues and different colors of those. It matters. Amazing. <laughs> yep. So this is a polykeet, just to give you an idea, um, kind of a saltwater worm, if you will. Uh, and this one actually, because of how it's situated in the water is, is fairly opaque or maybe even olive, but it definitely is see-through enough that it can imitate the color of whatever it's resting on. So having these in different colorations is, is key to being uh, effective if you're going to choose to fish them. And there's another version of it sitting in my hand out of the water for a while. So definitely a darker coloration. Be fast. They can move quicker than you might think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> People that have a problem with them get a little freaked out by it. <laughs> so if you're if you've fished the salmon fly hatch and caught a big fish and felt the salmon the salmon fly is still crawling around in their belly the fish here keep, treat the chum fry the same way they gorge themselves and when you land one they will absolutely throw up a whole freaking mouthful of these of these fish and i mean this fish in my hands probably eight inches long ten inches long and it had it coughed up like three of those four inch freaking uh bait fish gnarly that fly right there in the corner is kind of that surface fly, the sound searcher I was right. talking about. Super easy tie. Um, and here's here's what you're looking for. Like I try to walk out on the beach and, and have people see this. And then I like to use my rod tip to sort of spook them because you can get close enough where they'll be natural, but then you touch the water with the rod tip and they'll spook. And when you do that here, you'll see them just go in all directions. Because they look over their shoulder, they're like, Bob, good luck. See ya. You know. <laughs> Have another question. Um, yeah. I don't know if I'm going to read this right, but 
He asked, how do you get to the fish? It looks like a long haul. And I answered, 20 to 30 foot cast. But how far of a drive for you guys from like your shop to fishing? Yeah, no, great question. Um, it's it's why I've I've been trying to push people so hard towards learning Puget Sound. Gas prices up here currently are almost five bucks a gallon. Um, so the idea of still scratching that itch, uh, but not wasting that much fuel to get there to do it. Um, Puget Sound covers from clear up at the Canadian border, clear down past Olympia. So if you live in that 120 mile radius, you're within 15 minutes of the sound probably. So you don't have to drive far. I guess is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And I usually encourage people to, you know, if you're, if you live where I live, which is right by this airport, I've got five beaches within 15 minutes of me. And so I just got, I get to know those beaches really well. So I can kind of assess the tide the night before, assess the wind and choose a beach based on those criteria and run out and, and get after it, you know, and in, in that same spirit, in the summertime, it's, it's light at four 30 in the morning up here. Oh. And in, in the summer, it's light until almost 10 o'clock. And so, you know, what I see often, and this is a euphosid, by the way, um, what I see often is, and this is a copepod. I want to get to something a little more interesting to look at chum fry. Um, what I see all too often is people, uh, another Ufaza, you know, seeing a day three months down the road and, and setting their schedule aside to be able to go hit the water for that day. Here, here's my day. And as it gets closer, the anticipation builds, the excitement builds, and then the day arrives and we have an atmospheric river, uh, show up, which is what we're calling a freaking torrential downpour up here now. Um, and the wind's blowing 40 and there isn't anything within 200 miles that's fishable. And so that day that they had had set aside for fishing is now snubbed and now they, and now they're like, well, shit, now I've got to like, pardon my, pardon my language there. Crap. Now I've got to try to schedule another day. So now they've gone three months without fishing and there's who knows until the next day that they're going to be able to go. My, my encouragement is, wake up at four, go fish for an hour or two, and then come back and be there to wake your kids up and get them fed and get them to school or hop into the seat and get ready to go to work on Zoom, if anybody's still doing that, or get off work and put the kids to bed and go fish for an hour or two until dark. Um, you know, we have for, for four months of the year, we've got the opportunity for people to get those little tiny insertions of fly fishing in and be better for it than trying to uh, squeeze in an entire day and, and hang all their hopes on that one day. And I think people are, you know, mentally in a better place if they can get out for just little stints here and there. And maybe they, maybe they fish five times in a month that way, you know, and maybe it's not the whole day, but at least they can get out and get after it. And yes. so those, that's a school of herring. And when the herring are around, it's ridiculous. They're so thick that when you're fishing through them, you'll oftentimes broadside hook them as you're pulling your fly through there. What was that last <laughs> bug? Uh, that was a baby uh, halibut oh, wow. or sunfish. And on certain beaches, when you step out in the morning, you'll see hundreds of these just scooting out into the deeper water and they'll eat these too. Um, so that's a, that's a herring, that big one. That was a, uh, or Pacific smelt and you can see the blue in the back. And so that was kind of what I was saying, being able to play with the coloration and the flies that you tie, uh, make this fishery really fun for, for the creative fly tire. Totally. And that one was probably nine, 10 inches long. So tying something that big for Kings would make a lot of sense. Cutthroat, probably not so much. And there's your copepod too. So 
kind of a potato looking bug thing that crawl around on the rocks. So big, huge, think big, huge scud, it ends up doing a pretty decent job of that. Immature uh, herring, so they, they're iridescent and clear until sometimes called silver side until they start to get that um, coloration in the body. Pink salmon fry, again, that coloration in the back. See that tail? Yeah, I know it disappears onto my hand right there. Sand lance or candlefish on from the East Coast. Sounds like they have a pretty diverse set of food. Yeah, they do. And they're not always all out there at the same time. So it's not like you, it's a little bit like your hatches in a river. You start with blue winged olives and then you come to squalla stones and then you come to PMDs and then caddis and then stoneflies. Yeah. Um, kind of the same thing here. They sort of, you know, move through those hatches, if you will, seasonally. A little shrimp. Interesting. Double. They'll eat these too. Little tiny, um, little tiny uh, uh, jellyfish moving through. They'll they'll gobble these up. I've watched them watched them do that a number of times. You're out there going, "What in the hell are they eating?" And it's these little things. And that thing's probably about as big as the down to the first knuckle of your thumb. Any other questions or anything? Nothing? Right now, no. Doesn't look like we have any more questions as of yet. All right. I think we're, uh... yeah, that was pretty, pretty thorough. Anyone got any questions? Type it in now or forever hold your phone. Um, just call Emerald Water Angels. Yeah. So this is the sound searcher I was talking about that, okay, yeah. that I use most prominently. Um, my dad actually developed it for smallmouth bass down on the Umpqua. <laughs> And I was looking at it and I was like, I need to take one of those up to the sound and play around with it. And I think the first day I fished it, we caught like seven fish on it. Nice. And I was like, yep, this is going to work. Almost like a small gurgler. Yeah, it is. It's exactly what it is. It's a small gurgler. And he, he ties it another way too. If when you tie that, if you poke a hole in the foam and pull it under the eye of the, underneath that eye of the hook and then tie it off, it'll dive when you strip it and then it'll kind of do this back of the surface. And that can be a really fun way to fish too. That's pretty sweet. Um, and then this was another one that he tied, uh, not as fun to cast, believe it or not, that head just doesn't, doesn't turn over real well. Um, which I guess I should, I can address that too. So we're fishing five, six weights. I kind of left off at that. Uh, not your normal trout leader, even though fish are the same size, they're not leader shy. You can see the size of the flies you're fishing. You don't need to be discreet on that. Um, I usually fish seven and a half, one X or two X leaders. Um, I just want to get, I want to get the fly to the water quick. I don't want to collapse out there at the end. Um, beaches are hungry behind you. So having a thicker tippet on there is going to help keep you from leaving flies on the beach on your back cast. Um, a few other fly variations that, that we've used in the past. Um, the, uh, if you're, if you're using an intermediate line and you're not from a boat, you've got to have a stripping basket. Uh, it's kind of one of the other reasons I like fishing a floating line is when you watch people that are accustomed to fishing a certain way and just retrieving line, as soon as you put a stripping basket in front of them and force them to try to their fly in this little bucket, it changes their retreat. So if you go back to, you know, how you present your fly and understanding how the bait fish move in order to do it, this is a classic example of a fly I found from one of my clients who hooked it on a barnacle on his back cast. Um, uh, 
trying to force your line into this little stripping basket changes your retrieve. And so a lot of times you watch people be less successful the first few times they get their stripping basket out there because they're, they've changed how they're fishing for lack of a better way of saying it. And so I know that all the photos you see of people in stripping baskets is this really nice proper tray, just sort of right in, right in front of you. Like you're carrying a tray in a restaurant. That's not where you're going to wear it unless you have to, um, you're going to wear it off to your stripping side and more or less down almost kind of around the top of your thigh so that it's far enough away that you can get a full length strip into it without altering how you're retrieving your fly. Um, and sometimes this fly doesn't break off, but the hook does. And you'll see, <laughs> see people getting bites, but not getting hookups and they start getting frustrated and you go over there and the hook's broken off right about where that one's stuck in that barn. Um, so if you are fishing this, you know, up here in this area, definitely check your fly regularly to make sure it actually has the point on it still. Um, cause you'll hit your back cast more than you, more than you understand. Got, um, got another question for, yeah. from JG. Uh, yeah. what, what do you think about the golden gardens area or North? Okay. Yeah. Uh, golden gardens, if you're familiar with it. Um, there is, uh, kind of two faces to that three faces of that beach. You've got the Sandy point where everybody goes and parks on the beach behind and watches what you're doing as your fly bounces off their blanket. Um, and that Sandy beach is really not as productive. It kind of provides that place where I think most trout are going to go zing by that. Cause there's nothing compelling for them to be there unless there's bait on the beach at that moment. Just south of that, though, more in front of where the parking is, if you notice the structure of the beach changes from that sand to more of that, you know, fist sized gravel covered with barnacles and stuff like that, and has a little bit more of a gentle pitch as opposed to being that steep drop like you get on the sandy point. So that southern part is great and is fishable at most of your tide levels to some degree. Um, when you get to a really low tide, if you go north, and up past where the creek flows in up next to the bulkhead, you get um, you get a good amount of structure up there too. And you definitely get away from all the people because the beach isn't there. So if that's what's close to you, go for it. Um, Karkeek is another beach just, just north of that that I think has a little bit better substrate along the entire thing um, that I would suggest checking out if you haven't been there before. But yeah, either of those two on the north end of town are good. Uh, Richmond Beach is just beyond that as well. So you got three solid beaches within 20 minutes of each other right there. Sweet. Sounds like someone's been to Seattle before. I like it. <laughs> Maybe they're even there now. Uh, the other reason for the stripping basket, even if you're doing a floating line, is in the summer, you know, starting here pretty soon, we'll get kelp in the water. And the kelp with your floating line laying in the water if you've never been frustrated fly fishing before, come on up. <laughs> Let me introduce you to kelp and your uh, line you're trying to shoot. Uh, you ha almost have to use a stripping basket unless you're obtusely stubborn like I am. And I just find beaches where I don't have to deal with it. <laughs> just, I can't stand using the stripping basket. But this is another good reason to have one. On the stripping basket front, these ones and the scientific angler ones are a soft kind of malleable material. Um, the hard plastic ones hurt when you strip your hand into them and they break. Uh, these ones, as well as a couple of others that collapse like fish ponds, I don't even know if fish ponds even still making that and almost positive they aren't, but in the past, there's been people that have made collapsible ones that will, uh, William and Joseph, if you are been in the sport long enough to remember them, they made a pretty nice one. Um, but take the one from scientific anglers. Great. You don't have to contain the line. Uh, my favorite one is actually a plate with a bunch of prongs. Like I can show you how to make one of these for five bucks and it would work better than this $80 one probably. Um, <laughs> All, all you need to do is have it off the water and the more loops you tightly confine, you're inevitably going to end up with loops coming up and cinching on top of the line and, and sort of thwarting your shoot anyway. So 
just having it hang over the edge like this on both sides. So, but off the water is, is ideal. That's why having it far enough away that you can just kind of loosely throw the line at it, as opposed to trying to stuff it neatly into it works great. I've even had people sort of trim the front of this across the top of the take and kind of gently bow it up towards the sides so that it has that ability to let line flow off the, off the front of it a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, we got to be getting close here. <laughs> I got one other question for you from, from, yeah. from, from me. Um, do you ever do like a striper type strip where you're stri sticking the rod under your armpit and kind of hand over? Yeah. Two hand. Way? Yeah. Yeah. You can do that. Um, I guess we didn't really talk about retrieve that much either. Uh, yeah, that's, I think by and large, when I, when, when we're out there and people call or have questions about, Hey, I'm seeing fish not getting strikes and I've tried everything. Um, I always, my first impression is always change your retrieve before you change your fly. Um, especially if, if they're cutthroat and that's kind of one of the problems out here when fish are boiling, and you're new to the fishery, you won't be able to tell sometimes if they're resident coho or if they're resident blackmouth or if they're cutthroat. Um, blackmouth is, is a term we use for resident Chinook that don't go to the Aleutians. They stay local. Uh, they stay in the sound. Um, and they will feed differently. Like the salmon will be a little bit more finicky about what they take. Uh, but for cutthroat, I'm almost always, you know, change your retrieve before you change your, before you change your fly. And my retrieve is generally arm length at a fairly consistent pace with a sharp start and finish. Now, as you start to, if, if you can ever get yourself in a place where you catch enough fish that you can be paying attention to where in the retrieve you are getting your strikes, that can help you a lot of times understand better what the fish are looking for and trying to be more consistent in your presentation. So sometimes you'll pick them up just at the beginning of your strip. Sometimes you'll get them through that acceleration to the stop. Other times you'll get them on the drop and pause when you're coming back up to grab your line. And if you can pay attention close enough to that split second of time between those three elements, it can allow you to focus on when on in the retrieve to spend more time. And that'll, I've seen that work to try to draw more strikes more regularly, like playing around with it. And finally we get a strike. I'm like, oh, that was on the pause. So I would make maybe shorter strips and longer pauses and let it just kind of hover. Sometimes the fly will give a little bit of a drop and then it'll kind of perk back up and they'll pick it up as it's doing that descent. Like they maybe already tail slapped it, stunned it, and they're just kind of swinging by to pick it up. Um, and then sometimes, like you're saying, sometimes you just underhand. Typically, I find that that's just too fast of a retrieve. Like you'll spend more time casting than fishing because you're going to pull your line in and be back out, you know, back up casting really quickly. Um, and you're really, I don't use that often. I know some people that do, but I don't use that often, Andy. Okay. And then we had someone just ask, what is the best strip slash retrieve tempo? But yeah, for me, like I said, it's, it's kind of, about like that. Nice. Does that ever change um, with water temperature? No, not really. Um, if anything, the water temperature, all it does is drive the, tr the cutthroat to find cooler water. Um, but I, it doesn't necessarily, in, at least as far as I've seen, change how they, um, how they react to your retrieve. It goes back, in my opinion, more to what it is that they're feeding on and how those food forms uh, react to either being stunned or chased or um, whatever. Some of them are very fragile and will, <laughs> for lack of a better way of saying it, have a heart attack and just kind of like stop and, and dead float for a minute. Uh, maybe that's part of their uh, elusive uh, guys, but yeah, um, no, pretty much all observational science. I know some people like to strip super fast. <laughs> At the end of the day, like I said in the beginning, 
uh, we all have opinions on how we like to fish and all of us, you know, all of us that are doing it up here professionally, um, find pretty regular success doing it that way. So, um, I still believe the key is, is paying close attention to the entomology and trying to imitate as much as possible, as opposed to being, you know, instead of being the humpy or the, um, or the, uh, oh, whatchamacallit, or the deceiver, you know, be a specific bait fish. Um, a couple last things on, on the strip set. So for streamer fishermen or stream, streamer anglers, excuse me, uh, tip always in the water, especially in the sound. You want that connectivity to your fly. As your fly line, as your line starts to sweep through in the current, you want to follow it with your rod tip. Rod being above the water, every time you strip, the line tightens and relaxes, tightens and relaxes, and it takes those sharp edges off of your retrieve. Doesn't make it look elusive. Uh, and same thing when your line is here and your rods here when you strip in your rod bends with the weight of that line every time you retrieve it and it does exactly the same thing it softens the edges or the corners of your retrieve so always follow your line and point straight at it when you set or before you even set uh instead of retrieving all the way to your leader i like to when i've got about 15 to 20 feet of line out i will sweep my rod kind of at water's level, uh, at water level across in front of me and kind of up into a roll cast position. And you'll notice you draw that fly right in pretty close to where it would be if you stripped into your clear into your leader. At that point, then I can just roll cast that 15 feet or so that I already have out and sh shoot just a little bit on it. And then I'm picking up and in two casts, I'm back at, you know, 60, 70 feet. If you strip all the way into your leader, you're going to spend a lot of time just sitting here rah, 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 false casting. And I like to see people fly in the water. I don't, I don't know if anyone's ever explained this to you before, but fish don't live in the air as much as false casting is fun and beautiful and a way to show off and, and stuff like that. If you're actually fishing, you're not fishing with your fly up, up in the air. Um, so I like to get it in there as quickly as possible. And that is all very relevant for here. Yep. As well. And then when you set the hook, you know, instead of trout setting, coming straight up, kind of like I was saying before, where you come across in front of you, I set the hook to the side so that if I miss the fish, my fly doesn't come sailing out of the water. My line drag and everything keeps it right there because when a fish misses a, a, a fly, if they didn't sting themselves or they didn't taste the fly in the process, they'll come back and hit it again. And so you'll get three, four, five takes on that if you do it, if you set to the side, set to the side, set to the side, and it doesn't need to be a huge set. They're trying to kill this freaking thing. So they take it with like full gusto. It's not this emerger sip. They, they're trying to trounce the thing. Um, bunch of sea lice on the back that's one of the things that they're studying up here is just sort of why we've got more and more sea lice showing up on the backs of our of our fish not good for them not good pulling them off of them either unfortunately um any other questions i, I mean i like i said i can talk forever so <laughs> i think we've seen about that's all the questions we have it looks like and one right. guy just said, thanks for your time, information, and passion, Dave. Absolutely. My pleasure. I, uh, again, reiterate um, uh, the honor in being asked back to here. It was uh, super fun, and, and uh, I hope everyone has a great spring and summer down there, and the wildfires stay at bay. Yeah. <laughs> if you're ever in Seattle, call me. Yep. Uh, that he. This is, uh, of course, for those joining us late, Dave McCoy. And he works up or owns uh, Emerald Water Anglers up in Seattle. So if you ever want to change the scenery and you're up in the area or got a business trip, go fishing up there for sure. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank, Thank you all. You. And uh, again, we are going to be uh, continuing this tomorrow night with um, Britta Fordyce. She will be 
presenting some fly tying, 5.30 YouTube channel. And then Saturday, 10 a.m. at Santa Rita Park till 3 p.m. And then we're going to be doing our drawing for all of our giveaway stuff at the shop at 4 o'clock. Um, so thanks, everyone, for joining us. And just call us at the shop or call Dave at uh, Emerald Water Anglers if you have any questions. All right. Show up on Sunday and give Dave Allen a hard time for me. Yeah. Yep. Dave Allen, for sure, will be there. So <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll all harass him. All right.